Hey everybody, welcome to session 2.3 where we talk about non-charitable behaviors or in other words, behaviors that will threaten your status as a nonprofit organization. We're going to talk first about uh, private benefit and private inurement. Uh, the second way that you can upset the IRS is through what are called excess benefit transactions. And then finally, if you're a private foundation or private operating foundation, a third way you can do this is through what's called self-dealing. And we need you to be familiar with all three of these. So starting first with private benefit and private inurement, uh, I want to emphasize that this applies to all nonprofit organizations, this uh, standard of behavior. So here are three scenarios that we're going to talk through. The first involves a foundation a charitable foundation that is sustaining a, a plantation in the South to act as a historical landmark. They claimed an educational purpose, which uh, normally would be provided tax exempt status. The problem starts with the fact that the son of the founder of the foundation lives on the plantation grounds rent free. Now, the reason he lives there rent free is because he's been hired as the caretaker. Um, He's being paid what a caretaker would normally be paid. And it's typical to allow a caretaker to live on the grounds without having to pay rent. Um, and so this doesn't actually cause the problem yet. Here's where the problem comes in. They made no effort whatsoever to have this plantation be available to the public. They didn't invite elementary school classes to tour it. They didn't, they didn't open it up to public tours. They just basically maintained it so the son could live there. This violated the restrictions on private benefit uh, because essentially their only activity was providing a free place for this kid to live and not doing any other charitable activity made this a substantial private benefit. And so the IRS removed their exempt status. Here's another scenario, this time involving a church. This is a, a religious organization that's controlled primarily by its founders. Okay, so far that's how that typically works. They're compensated, though, with a share of the income of the organization, meaning that the more contributions they can bring in to the church, the more they get paid. Now, right there, you might say, oh, that's not OK. Um, technically, it is. Um, and a lot of large nonprofits will actually co do incentive compensation for their executives based on how effectively they fundraise. But here's where the problem came in. There was no upper limit on the income sharing. So if you were one of the founders of this church and you were paid 5% of, of all the contributions that came in, if you just paid that for however many contributions come in, you're basically an owner. And this is what the IRS called private inurement, a distinction that we will describe in a minute. But this was wrong to do. Here's a third one. This is the Callaway Family Association, and this was an organization formed to trace the genealogy of the Callaway family in America. Now here they also claimed an educational purpose. They say they're learning and teaching about American history using the Callaway family as a way to do that. And so that would normally be a legitimate exempt purpose. Um, but here's where the problem came in. The organization's principal activity was supporting 600 dues-paying members to complete the genealogy of the family. So they weren't educating people about the Callaway family. They weren't going out and teaching or sharing this information to the general public. They were focused instead on a specific group of people that were paying dues, descendants presumably of the Callaway family, and uh, therefore not really furthering a charitable purpose, but instead were focused on specific individuals. This was considered a substantial private benefit relative to all their activities. And so this group didn't have exempt status. They were applying for it, but it was denied. And the reason I share these examples is because they illustrate these concepts of private benefit and private inurement. It's interesting how this works in the tax code because the tax code says that a nonprofit has to be operated exclusively for a charitable purpose. That would exclude anything that's not considered charitable, which is pretty excessive language. I mean, if you think about it, there's a lot of little things that happen in a nonprofit. I mean, what if the nonprofit buys a birthday cake to celebrate an employee's birthday? Well, guess what? That's not considered charity. And uh, if we use this language in its most extreme interpretation, that means the nonprofit would lose its exempt status for buying a birthday cake for an employee. So the Treasury Department recognized how that's a little too extreme of an interpretation. So they've interpreted that phrase, operate exclusively, 
to mean it, it, that you can't do anything other than insubstantial activity. So as long as the non-charitable activity is insubstantial, then you're okay. So this means only substantial private benefits that are not charity count as private benefit. So, so only the only benefits that are considered substantial and non-charitable are what violate this law. But the IRS doesn't set a specific threshold for substantiality. They don't say it's this percentage of your total activity or anything like that. They take it on a case-by-case basis. So for nonprofits, that means you have to be especially careful in the way you approach this issue. Um, private inurement is different. Um, inurement is generally considered in the context of insiders, people who have control of the organization. And basically, the IRS is going to ask this question. Is there any way that the organization's profits are guaranteed to go to an individual? Because if that's true, then they're basically like owners. And, and really, anything analogous to ownership in this financial sense is going to cause trouble with the IRS. And so private inurement is kind of like a form of private benefit, where private benefit is all non-charitable purposes that are substantial. Private inurement is those non-charitable purposes that look and act like ownership. And so where that's happening, then you've got private inurement. So this kind of gives you a, a sense of understanding how this works. Uh, the consequence of, of, uh, of a finding of private benefit or private inurement, the IRS has only one option, which is to remove your tax-exempt status. Uh, accountants and lawyers in this area generally call that the nuclear option because the consequences are so substantial. If you lose your tax exempt status, it means not only do you pay income taxes, but if they strip your status through what's called a look back period, meaning removing your status during a time period where you're in violation of the law, all the donations that were made to you are also not tax deductible, which means all those donors have to go back and amend their tax returns. And so it's really it's a really bad thing to happen to a nonprofit to lose their exempt status. And yet that's the only that's the only um punishment that the IRS has available in a finding of private benefit or private inurement. We're going to discuss some of these questions in class, like what's the difference between these things and why would we require this for tax exempt status? Okay, so that's the first category. The second category is called excess benefit transactions. And what comes with them is something called an intermediate sanction. And this also pl applies to all nonprofits. So realizing that the nuclear option is a really extreme punishment for a private benefit, Congress decided to come up with something in between. Um, and so here the tax code written by Congress imposes an excise tax or a punishment or penalty tax on what's called an excess benefit transaction. This is essentially where the charity overpays for something. So if the over charity, oh, if the charity, sorry, overpays for something, then the IRS has a chance to apply what's called an intermediate sanction. The reason this is called intermediate is because it's not as bad as revoking tax exemption. Removing tax exempt status is as bad as it gets. And so here we're going to do a, a sort of middle step before we have to go that far by applying a penalty tax. Excess benefit transactions only apply if the payment is made to somebody called a disqualified person, I'm going to define that for you in a minute. Um, so what this means in context of what we just talked about before is that private benefit and private inurement don't necessarily require intermediate sanctions because they don't always involve a DQP. You might provide a substantial private benefit to somebody who's not in this list of disqualified persons. If that's the case, it's not going to be an excess benefit, and there's not going to be an intermediate sanction. The IRS will have to go straight to the um, to the the nuclear button. So, who are DQPs? For excess benefit transactions, DQPs are these people. And you'll notice these are all people who have substantial influence over the organization. So that's going to include any directors, officers, and managers. It's going to include any substantial donors. It's going to include family members of the above, and families defined as spouses, siblings, ancestors, and descendants. And then it's also going to include companies that are at least 35% owned by DQPs. So we're basically spread, we start with these core DQPs who are directors, officers, and managers, and substantial donors. And then we're also going to draw a circle of relate people who are related to them through these family relationships. 
and then another circle to include companies that are controlled by these individuals. We'll talk through some scenarios together in class to test, to make sure you understand the boundaries of this, of this uh, status as a DQP. So if a nonprofit overpays a DQP, then that creates an excess benefit transaction. So how do they penalize this? So let's talk about who pays the penalty, why they pay it, and for how much. So if they overpay for something, the disqualified person has to pay, has to pay because they received an excess benefit. And what they have to pay is 25% of the total excess benefit. And so there's a little reading that you have to do with this class session about a hospital CEO who was hired at $300,000 a year, but the IRS claimed he was only qualified to be paid $200,000 a year. Well, a CEO, that means he's a DQP, and the IRS found that he was being overpaid by 100 grand a year. So the $100,000 is the excess benefit. That means the penalty tax that applies is he has to pay two, uh, sorry, uh, $25,000 to the IRS. He also, by the way, has to return the $100,000 that he was overpaid to the hospital. We're not going to stop there, though. We're also going to punish all of the managers who participated in the excess benefit. In this case, it would be all the board members that voted for his compensation. My guess is that it was probably a unanimous vote. And so all those board members that voted yes on this compensation for the CEO, they owe 10% of the excess benefit up to $20,000. So in this case, the excess benefit was hundred grand that the CEO is being overpaid. That means each of the board members that approved this compensation owe a penalty to the IRS equal to $10,000. But we're not going to stop there. If the DQP, in this case our hospital CEO, doesn't pay back the $100,000 within a year, then he owes the IRS 200% of the total excess benefit. He still has to pay back the hundred grand to, to the hospital, and he still has to pay the $25,000 for the first level of this penalty, but now he also has to pay an additional 200%, which in this case would be an additional $200,000 for not paying back the hospital in time. Now this probably feels really extreme. And so uh, this is why I'm teaching you about it is because these are real consequences. And you should be asking how you can avoid this circumstance happening to you. So here's some tips on avoiding them. First of all, you need to avoid the burden of proof. In most laws, the way it works is if you break the law, um, you're innocent until proven guilty. In this case, you are presumed guilty unless you can prove your innocence. And that would mean you'd have to show that it's not an excessive amount that you were paid if you were the DQP in this case. <clears throat> the way you can shift the burden of proof onto the IRS, however, so that way you're innocent until proven guilty, is to do these three things. Make sure that the Board of Directors approves compensation of all DQPs. Make sure that when they approve compensation for DQPs, they rely on comparable data, meaning they look at what other people have paid elsewhere for that same work and, and, and based on those same qualifications. And then finally, you have documentation of all of this. If you do these things, then the burden of proof shifts to the IRS, and they have to prove that it was an excessive benefit rather than you having to prove that it was not. But some other ways to avoid it, other things to remember, make sure you know who all the DQPs are in your organization. Anytime you're negotiating with a DQP, make sure you do it at arm's length. Don't make it buddy-buddy and super friendly. Treat them like you would like you would somebody else in a negotiation. If you have any loans, make sure you document them and don't do loans without having without putting collateral on the line. And make sure you have them follow a conflicts of interest policy. These things will all help you avoid these problems. So we're going to discuss the policy implications of this. Are, are intermediate sanctions a good idea? Are they a bad idea? Why do we have them? And also, shouldn't the business judgment rule protect against intermediate sanctions? Why is a board member being punished when the business judgment rule says that as long as it was good faith, that they're okay? So we're going to talk about that as well. Okay, on to our third category. This is the last one. This is self-dealing. Self-dealing only applies to private foundations and private operating foundations. And this works differently because what it does is it forbids transactions with disqualified persons, the DQPs we've been talking about, and it forbids these transactions based on the character of the transaction, not the amount. So what that means is it doesn't matter what the underlying value was. If it was this kind of transaction, it's forbidden. 
So if you're a private foundation, you can't sell, exchange, or lease property to or from a disqualified person. You can't engage in loans to or from a disqualified person. You can't provide goods or services. You can't pay compensation. You can't benefit the DQP with any of the organization's assets. This is, again, not forbidden by amount, but forbidden by their nature or character. The only exception to the compensation rule is that you can pay them for what are called personal services that are reasonably compensated and necessary to the charitable purpose. And the IRS considers a personal service something that the DQP is doing directly. So sitting on the board of directors is something the DQP is doing. You can pay a director of a private foundation, but you couldn't pay their company to provide accounting services, for example. Who are DQPs for self-dealing? The list is the same with one exception. Siblings are not considered DQPs for private foundations. Uh, everything else is the same. And I don't know why the IRS has, why the why the tax code has two different rules here on siblings in the case of excess benefit versus self dealing. Okay, so how do we punish self dealing when it happens? Well, we're going to punish the DQP for the self dealing, and we're going to make them pay ten percent a ten percent penalty tax to equal to the total value of the transaction. We're going to punish the managers who participated five percent of the transaction up to twenty thousand dollars. And if the, if the transaction is not undone, uh, then uh, the disqualified person has to pay 200% of the value of the transaction. So to kind of do a little exercise here, um, uh, a corporation's foundation is making donations to a school where the corporation recruits. So here you've got this corporation and it controls a foundation and that foundation makes donations to this school, but the corporation benefits from this relationship because that's where the corporation goes to recruit. Is this a self-dealing transaction? Well, the first question we have to ask is, is there a DQP involved and, and who's receiving the benefit? In this case, the school is getting the donation. That means there's no DQP because the school's not a DQP. And so that transaction is okay. These are real examples, by the way, from tax law. Here we have a DQP who's the highest bidder in the foundation's public auction, meaning that this was an auction where anybody could participate. Usually in these fundraising auctions, the things that are being bought are being purchased for higher than their value because it's really a donation. They're not just buying a vacation at a deal. They're probably overpaying for it at the auction. Well, we have a DQP. So the next question is, is it, is it a transaction of forbidden character? Well, it's a sale of something. It doesn't matter that it's a sale through a public auction. It's still a sale. Because it's a sale, it's a, it's a, it's a forbidden transaction. So here we have self-dealing. So that is not allowed. Here we have a DQP that's using a meeting room at a foundation, but the meeting room is available to the general public. Now, normally you're not allowed to furnish any of your goods or services to a DQP, but the IRS has looked at that and said, uh, as long as it's not done in a way that's exclusive, it's, if, if the property, if the meeting room is available to the general public whenever, that's going to be okay. This sort of de minimis stuff the IRS isn't anxious to punish people for. But here's another one. A foundation gives money to a for-profit company to pay for glasses for the needy, and the for-profit company is owned by a disqualified person. Well, we have a DQP in the person, so the next question is, is the company disqualified? And in this case, the answer is yes. And then we have, do we have, a, do we have a forbidden transaction? Well, giving a bunch of money would be a forbidden transaction. Remember, the DQP, his company is also a DQP by extension because of how the rules work. And so this transaction is forbidden. We're going to talk through these together in class so you can understand where the boundaries are. And we'll discuss these questions together. And so that's it. That's session 2.3. I look forward to seeing you in class.